As you're being seated today, I'd like you to think back through your life. Um, I was talking with somebody the other day about this, but I feel like we're missing or we're losing something in our culture uh, in the area of handwritten notes. Um, the fact that we rarely pin things. Um, in fact, uh, I regularly receive even Christmas cards or photos or whatever, and it's all electronically uh, generated. And then now and then, rarely, I get a card with a signature or a, a quick note of some sort. Um, but we have lost the art of uh, pinning in, in our hand, as we would say, uh, something to one another. But I'd like you to think back, back to the prehistoric era in your life, before some of that, to a note that you received. Maybe for some of those younger, maybe it has been something text to you uh, or something you received electronically, but handwritten notes specifically, um, that because of the fact you received that note, it changed your life. Uh, what's something that you had written? And don't go, don't, I don't want to lose you today, but just think back to significant moments where someone communicated something to you that your life has never been the same as a result of the contents and the, the import or the emotion or heart behind those words. Uh, I, I went through my mind and thought of several, but one, um, is my wife in here? Yes, she is. She, yes, she is. So this is the number one, okay? If she wasn't in here, it'd still be my number one. But um, I remember uh, feeling her out before we became, I mean, she was always interested in me from the moment she saw me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I wasn't her. Um, but that moment of kind of, remember that with your significant other where there's that awkward, you know, I got to put myself out there. I got to communicate, but I don't want to get shut down or shot down or whatever. Maybe some of you don't have that issue like I had. But uh, I remember feeling her out and then getting uh, my 98 old, my old 98. And you know what that kind of big old car I drove uh, in my college years. Um, that my dad and mom had, they let me borrow when I was back from college. And, and under the windshield wiper was the note. And I remember that note um, for a lot of reasons and what it meant, but specifically, I remember the note had kind of a beige color. It was kind of a tan color, um, and it had uh, clusters of grapes in the corner. It was like professional stationery. I could still visualize the exact envelope, and I remember opening up the windshield wiper, taking out that, that envelope, and then opening it up and reading to the feeler of me saying, are you interested or not? Um, of at least a maybe, okay? So at least it was a step forward. No, she was, she was expressing, yeah, I think maybe, you know, at some point this might work out or whatever. But it was the beginning of now the life we have. Um, Heidi, one of the things I appreciate about her, she loves Christmas. And Christmas has never been the same since we began having relationship. Um, and just her joy of the season, her zest for life. Um, that note continues to have a lingering effect. We have two boys. We have a lot of uh, shared memories and experiences, high moments, low moments that we've gone through together, but all because of that note and the words found in it. My question to you today is this, do you have the same relationship with God specifically in what he wrote when he gave to us the word Jesus Christ? Now what's interesting to me is the Gospel of John. John um, what was a man who loved Christ. This was not written by John the Baptist. This was written by the Apostle John. He was a man who knew Christ well. And the man who loved Christ the most wrote nothing of what we think of as it pertains to the Christmas story. Um, he didn't talk about as Matthew did, you know, some of the things we studied of Joseph and the dream, et cetera. He didn't talk about all the nuances of the story as Luke, the physician, did. Uh, Mark, you know, he launches right into some of the early miracles of Christ. But John deals specifically with the theological aspects of the incarnation. And that's what I want us to consider today is God's view on the incarnation. Think about this. The message of John, was it written to an exclusive few or is it the gospel written to the world? It is the global gospel. Um, the average Roman, the average Greek could care less about Bethlehem or these remote prophetic fulfillments of the Messiah that someday they would grow to appreciate. They just needed to know God came to our world. And where has he come and where can I find him? And so that's the message of John here in John chapter 1 that carries or develops this concept of the word. And you see here this word, word, capital W, used over and over, an emphasis upon Jesus is the vehicle of God's communication. The question today is how can a few words embodied in the Christ child change our world today? Let's not just talk about in the past, let's talk about in the here and now. 
And what I want to do for a few moments is work through this statement of Emmanuel and how it's described here in the Gospel of John, and therefore what these four profound words can do to change your story and mine. Number one, let's talk for a few minutes about the word God. God. In verses 1 and 2, we see that it refers to this word or this Jesus as being God himself. Look, if you will, first in verse number 1, it says this, In the beginning was the word. Go down to verse number 2. The same was in the beginning with God. I'm going to give you two statements under each of these four words. I'd encourage you to jot them down if you're able to do so today that I think can really change you and improve your walk with the Lord, your outlook of the new year, and whatever God has for you in the, in the near and distant future. Jot this down, first of all, if you will. Number one, we need to be changed by Emmanuel's eternality. We need to be changed by Emmanuel's eternality. He is from the beginning. Um, I don't know if this offends you or not. I'm sorry if it does. But um, somebody the other day said, quote, you know you're getting old when Santa starts to look younger. Uh, any of you in that cycle yet? Um, he doesn't look as old as he used to when I was a child or a young person. Uh, it's amazing how your perspective changes. Now, here's just the point today before we move on. When you think of the story of Christmas, what's the opening chapter in your mind? When did the Christmas story begin? Can I just encourage you, the Christmas story is not a couple thousand years old. It's from eternity. Do you realize how important it is to know that God who fills eternity is the one who has come? That, that this story began long before Bethlehem. This story began long before even the prophecies about Bethlehem. It began in the heart and mind of God. And if the God who fills eternity is involved in the Christmas story, then it's a big deal. It's a huge, significant, life-altering kind of realization that we must respond to. Micah 5 and verse 2, as it prophesies of where the Messiah would be born, Christ, the Word, says this, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, come, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be rule in Israel. Notice this phrase. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's where this story started. It's a huge story. It's a life-changing story because it begins not in this life, but in eternity. Can I just encourage you today, because I know some of you have been going through things, or you're going to go through things in the, near, in, the, in the near future, that there's more going on than everything you know right now, everything you feel right now, everything you can see right now. There's a God of eternity who is working. He's working his will out. He's, he's right on point. He's right on task, and he wants to include you in this purpose that is from eternity. I'm finding in my life it's very easy to just get bogged down in the here and now. Is it for you, especially during this season, and to miss the eternal, large, grandiose plans and purposes of God that provide the context for the immediate things that I'm dealing with? I may I remind you the God of eternity has entered into your life. He has a plan. He has a purpose. Are you in, in step with it? And by the way, God has put a lot into offering you salvation from the foundations of the world. Already the lamb was prepared and the plan was in place to redeem you. Don't miss how much God has put into your salvation. All right, secondly, number two, look at verse uh, number one again. It says this, in the beginning was the word. Notice this, the word was with God and the word was God. Number two, in this area of Godness, or the fact that Jesus, the Emmanuel, is God, be changed by his eternality. Number two, be changed by his access. Be changed by Emmanuel's access. Two aspects of that. <laughs> First, remember that he was with God. Um, the language there has the idea of in the company with. Literally, in eternity past, only the Christ child, only this Emmanuel, only Jesus Christ was in the Holy Spirit were with God. There was no other beings. There were no other people. He issues forth from a close, consistent, accessible relationship with God. And when I think of the Christmas story, I often think of the baby, but I don't think of the person who predates the baby, the person who spent eternity with God. Before he was with us, he was with God. And to touch him, to listen to him, to interact with him is to touch, to hear, to interact with the person who has been with God. And so he was with God. And then you notice, just to be clear, John says, and the word was God. 
Not only was he with God, but he was God. And I don't mean to offend in any way today, but there are several cults and, and, and precincts of theological teaching that would say that this means the Word was a God, um, teaching a polytheistic view of Jesus. Yes, he was God, but he was one of many gods. He was a God instead of he was God, singular. We, this morning, we suffer often from an artificial sense of entitlement May I encourage you today, Jesus, who was with God and who is God, is the only access we have to God. You, listen, you don't deserve any interaction with God today. I don't deserve to hear from his word, sense his spirit, hear him teaching and speaking and drawing me. I only have that right and that privilege through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verses 4 and 5 speaks of God, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God... And one mediator between God and men, who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. So the word is eternal, the word is is in relationship to the God that we claim to love and serve, and he is God. And I have a hard time truly, honestly, believing, (laughs) when I'm just thinking humanly, that God came to a manger. God came to my heart as a five-year-old boy and drew me into relationship with him. God wants, to meet with, God wants to meet with me and wants to meet with you today. That's an important term, an important word, and it will change you when you look for God during this sacred season. All right, go back to our text, if you will, now to verse 3. And notice the second word in this concept of Emmanuel as referenced by John. All things were made by him, notice, Without him was not anything made that was made. In him, notice this, was life. And the life was the light of men. All right, number two, let's talk for a few minutes about is. God is uh, with us. God is. Um, The other day I saw a picture that Tolles has posted of um, they do a stocking, I think, every year to, to, to pace how much their kids grow. Like they have a decent sized stocking and they put baby in stocking, then one year old, two year old. And I think, Cassie, did, you, or did I see a picture of you in it? It came like up to her shins, you know, um, as she's growing, as she's progressing. Um, I think we're so used to the cycles of life and growth and then decline that we, we fail to appreciate God just is. He, he's a constant. He's a, he's a consistent source. He's a faithful father. He just simply is. Let me give you two things that I think can change us in this area of God is. First of all, be changed by Emmanuel's life. Jot that down if you will. Be changed by his life. We see that referenced here in verse uh, number three. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything that uh, made that was made. In him was life, this life that he offers. Um, one of the missions of Jesus Christ is to honor or to reveal the Father. I don't know if you've thought about this, something for you to study in your own time. But one of the most <laughs> excuse me, effective ways that Christ reveals and honors the Father is by his creation. Christ had his hands and fingerprints all over the making of this planet, the making of each of us. His creation is a way to draw attention and to bring us into closer relationship with God. The heavens declare the glories of God. And everything that he has created, uh, he gives to it life, he gives to it purpose, and he points it all back to his Father, the true one and only God. And so this morning, everything we have in the area of life, not only our physical breath, but spiritual life is owed to the ministry and work of God is, this Emmanuel who offers to us life. Now go to verse 10, and you will notice that the world at large does not understand this principle. Look at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So God has made all things. Christ has made all things. He's the source of life. And you have people regularly inhaling and exhaling, walking around in a glorious creation, not knowing and not appreciating and responding to the Christ who has made all things. I trust today you're not a part of that that group. You know who Christ is. You know he's the source of your life. We touched on this a few weeks ago, but in Matthew chapter 1, where, it, where the angel tells Matthew, you will call his name Jesus. You know what the name Jesus means, right? Jesus means Jehovah saves. And the name Jehovah means self-existent one. So the self-existent one who needs no one is the only one who can save us. 
He's the source of life. Have you looked to him for salvation? Are you trying to find life and purpose and energy and power from subsequent things? Turn to God. Let Jesus Christ be the source of your life. Here's basically the summary. You are because he is. You are. You exist because he is. If he is not, you and I are not. We owe everything. We take every breath with his blessing. Uh, We experience anything spiritually in our life only through his provision and power. All right, go if you will back to our text now to the end of verse 4. And there's a second concept of his presence or him being an is kind of God or Savior that provides for us blessing. Look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was, notice this, the light of men. Be changed by Emmanuel's life. Number two, be changed by Emmanuel's light. Um, Can you imagine Christmas without lights? I think that's one of the things I most enjoy about this season, and I I love just driving through neighborhoods. Now, I'm the lazy guy in our neighborhood. I think we have a Christmas tree. If If you really squint, you can see through our front window. But I love to see the lights of the season. Can you imagine a Christmas where lights are banned? You know, we had some sort of, I don't know, rationing of electricity or something, and no lights allowed for this, how much that would change just the glow and warmth, the light of this season. You know, if the light of the world were to be taken out of the equation for a moment, do you realize how quickly our whole universe would shrivel up and die? How much we need his light? Anything you know today, anything you believe today, anything you can see today that's real and significant and spiritual is only because of his light. He is the one that can change us as we enter the light of his presence. In verses 4 and 5, <laughs> four and five, you notice it says in verse 5, we didn't get to it yet, and the light shineth in darkness, notice, and the darkness comprehended it not. He is the source of light. And there's this contrast in the Bible you will find over and over where light denotes knowledge, it denotes peace, it denotes joy, but darkness always is a characterization of death, ignorance, sin, separation from God. What is the greatest condemnation of the eternal condition of the person who does not receive Christ? It's not the flames, and it's not, it's, it's not all the physical things. It is outer darkness separated from all light, which is God, for all of eternity. That's the ultimate condemnation. And so we get light. We have light. We keep near the light because of Jesus Christ. Later in Christ's earthly ministry, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16, in reference to Christ, it says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Uh, What powerful imagery there that only is possible through Jesus Christ. Now, we don't live under the rule of Roman rule and, and the corruption that the Jews and other believers and people of that day lived under, but we live in a dark day. And the only way we're going to find light is not found in our politicians or economy or other things that are being promised and propped up right now. It is found through the light that only Christ can give. Go on, if you would, to verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, all right? Not the, the author of this book, but the John the Baptist, the cousin of Christ. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Notice this, why? That all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. A quick application for those of us who know Jesus Christ. May we be careful not to confuse ourselves with being the light, but that we are to be a, a refractor. We are to be a reflector of the light that God has given us. Um, one of the things that I have found is when you're in darkness, and I'm talking spiritually speaking, sometimes you have to be told what is the light. And I love that God in his grace and mercy sent someone to point people to Christ and say, he is the light. He is the light of the world. And and we have that responsibility now as believers to point others to the light of Emmanuel, God with us. May we be faithful witnesses for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 9 is a tough verse, but a convicting and challenging verse. Look at verse 9. That was the true light, speaking of Christ, which lighteth, notice this, every man that cometh into the world. What does that mean? Christ gives light to every man. Let me first begin by saying what it does not mean. This does not mean universal salvation or just general revelation. It's talking about the fact that every person has to deal with Jesus Christ. Either they receive the light of the gospel 
or they will someday stand under the light and judgment and scrutiny of his evaluation of them. We have to yield to his light. We have to uh, believe that he is the light of the world. Go to John chapter 3 for just a moment. This would bring this to application. Later, John revisits this concept. After the familiar verses of John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave, and all those great rich uh, passages there at the beginning of John, John chapter 3. Look at verse 18, John 3. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So the concept is this, we have to respond to the light. We have to receive the light. If we do not, we will someday still answer to the light, but we will answer in a way that results in judgment. Um, my wife, one of the neat things I enjoy about her is her connection to her granny, who is no longer with us. Brother Slagle was talking about what would you add to your Christmas. And me, the first thing that came to my mind is people I'd love to bring back you know, to family gatherings, that their humor Sorry, their cooking I miss, you know, other things like that that just contributed to the family feel of that gathering that now are gone, you know, with the Lord in eternity. Um, but my wife, her interaction with her granny, I knew her for a few years before she passed while we were married. Um, but uh, she has in her laundry room, which is down in our basement now, you know how they always advertise first floor laundry, first floor laundry? We don't have that, so pray for my wife. She has her laundry in the basement, the dingy, dark basement. But she always has had, since we've been married, she has a picture of her granny, and she puts it always in her laundry room, which is, I remember when I first saw it, I'm like, that's kind of disrespectful. You put a picture of your granny in the laundry room, you know? But I, several times she's reminded me of why she does that, which I need the reminder, I guess. But her granny would always say, because everybody would complain about, oh, I got a bunch of laundry to do. And she would say, hey, I did it before we had these machines. This is not something to complain about. These are wonderful contraptions we now get to wash. And she always had a sweet spirit about doing laundry. So I don't know if Heidi needs that reminder or what, but she has that picture of her granny in her laundry, her laundry room. Do you know that we have been given a picture of Christ that, that, that is a bright picture that can brighten the darkest corner? I don't know what you're dealing with today, but there's a light that he gives. And when we recognize him as the light of the world, when we receive his light into our heart and life, it changes us. I find in darkness, I find excuses and denials and all kinds of negative kind of things. But when I let the light in, it removes those excuses. It, it reminds me of my responsibilities. It changes me from the inside out. Be changed by the light of Emmanuel. This morning, the question I would ask you before we move on is this. Who is your life? Who is your light? Where are you looking today? Where are you drawing strength and encouragement and power from? If it's not Christ, you're missing out on what God has to offer. All right, thirdly, go back to our text in John 1. and Look now, if you would, at verse 12. As we follow this sequence of God is and now, look, if you will, at verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, notice this, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Thirdly, let's talk for a few minutes about the third word that changes everything, and that is not only God is, but thirdly, with. God is with. Um, if any of you notice as you're buying toys for your kids uh, or grandkids or someone else's that a lot of times you'll see in the small print at the very bottom of anything that has a powered type of thing that'll say batteries not included. Um, the other day I read of a guy who, um, I don't know if he was jaded or bitter about the fact that always that occurs, but he said as a dad, quote, I once uh, bought my kids a set of batteries for Christmas with a note attached that said, quote, toys not included just to make up for the other Christmases. Um, power. Um, you know, for a lot of us in our lives, the issue is not that we don't believe God and we don't believe that He is, but we feel like that's not a part of our existence. That is abstract. That, that's out here, and I need, I need the power. I need the, the solution in my own time and space. See, the message of Christmas <laughs> offers not only the problem, but the solution 
It gives us the batteries. It gives us the ability to experience what it means to be with God. And I would give you two things underneath of that you could jot down. Number one, be changed by Emmanuel's power. And we see that in verse 12, his power. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The unbelief of verses 10 and 11 that we just read, where he came to the world that knew him not. In verse 11, he came to his own, speaking of Israel, and they received him not. But it was not universal. Some believed, some received, and as a result, God gave to them the power or the right to become the children of God. Can I just encourage you today with this concept? Because if you miss this, you don't, you don't appreciate why Christ came. People do not naturally become the sons of God. That's not our default position. You know that, right? Otherwise, why did Christ come? The, the crazy things involved in the incarnation and then a, especially the cross of Calvary, what, that's senseless if we don't need him to be saved. And so Christ has, uh, has been sent on a rescue mission to give to us power. We are dead in trespasses and sins, and then he quickens us, the language that he makes us alive. One author I was reading this week said this, quote, the world can't save itself. That is the message of Christmas. We can't save ourselves. We need a Savior. And that's why God gave us Jesus Christ. That is why God is with us. Colossians chapter th- uh, 2 and verse 13, And ye being dead in sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, and hath forgiven all your trespasses. Later on in verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He overcame all the other powers so that we might be free to have salvation. All right, verse 13. He goes on to say this, which were born, not of, wood, uh, not of blood, nor of the will of, me- of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Number two, we are to be changed not only by the power of Emmanuel, but number two, jot this down by Emmanuel's will, his will. And I just quickly will go through verse 13. It says, first of all, which are born not of blood. This would have the idea that not of natural descent. Aren't you glad for that? Some of us are first generation believers in the room. It's not something that happens because my grandpa or my grandma or my daddy or my mama were a believer. There's no spiritual grandchildren. It's something we are born individually, and so it was not by descent. It was not of blood. It was not the result of human decision, this will of flesh. It was, it was not something that we, just we chose or we uh, offered or we figured out. It was something greater. And thirdly, it was not the result of a husband's will. It's not the same as procreation. It's not a willful decision. It's something supernatural. It's a birth of the Spirit. And when Jesus came, he came to offer us this birth, this birth that is a supernatural one. Um, the other day I saw a video, I don't know if you saw this or not, but it was a video uh, out of Indiana, and a little uh, boy was wrestling. Did you see, or a little girl was wrestling. Her name was Ruby uh, Lewis, five, and she was in her first wrestling match. I guess girls wrestle now. I wasn't aware of that as much as maybe you are. But anyway, she was wrestling, her first wrestling match, and her two-year-old toddler brother was sitting around the outside watching this. And they, you know, guy, I don't know anything about wrestling. I'm about to reveal that. Besides, I don't like what they wear. I would never be caught. I mean, I'd wear a sweater with a guy, but never wear one of those outfits. But anyway, uh, but the whistle blew or whatever, and the match started. And as soon as they collided, Ruby's little brother thought they were in a real fight. And so this toddler boy, they have the video of him. It made national news. He comes up out of his chair and just starts running and then slugging, like beating on the other kid, like, get off my sister. He was, he was there to defend his sister. Um, Do you know what the message of Christmas is? Jesus coming says God wants to save us. It's his will. It's not just something he has to do. It's not something begrudgingly he's willing to offer. He wants to save us. He wants to save you this morning. He wants to save your neighbor, your family member. He longs to see you receive him as Savior. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God wants to rescue us. The fact that Christ is with us, that God is with us, says his power is available, and he wants us to receive it. He wants us to be changed by it. 
All right, lastly, if you will, now let's hone in on the key verse in our text, and that is verse 14, which is the Christmas text of the Gospel of John. Look at verse 14. And the Word, <laughs> excuse me, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Fourthly and lastly, not only is God, uh, is He with, but He is with us. He is with us. I don't know if you had family gatherings yesterday or Friday night or if you have some this week, um, but I love getting together with family. And of all the things that binds me to my family and to my wife's family, I would say what we enjoy eating probably is one of them, um, where we like to go, traditions that we have. But I think one of the key things that binds you as a family is your sense of humor. Have you noticed that? Things that you guys think are hilarious or my family thinks are hilarious in a public setting doesn't trend real well with everybody else around you. They think it's dumb. They don't get it. You know, you got inside jokes over the years you've built together that you have to just say one word or look at one picture or see something and you all right away go in a certain direction and you just crack up laughing. A sense of humor. You know, there's something that we all as a part of the human race, as a family that we have, that I think sometimes we forget that's not so funny. And that is a, a silent yet desperate, um, need for a savior. We're all sinners. Uh, we all need Jesus Christ for him to come to us, to come down to where we are. Do you realize how much he had to condescend to do that? We just sang the song. I think it was one of the last songs for him to be a man, to become a man and be with us as men, to be with us as people, the, the stoop that that involved. Romans five verses 68 says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. God with us, he had to come down to where we are as ungodly people. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some will even dare die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came for us. And I think sometimes we forget because we keep up certain profiles when we're in these kind of settings. But let's think about us for a moment. Let's think about what that means for God to come to us to come to where we are at with all of our shortcomings, to say the least, to miss the mark by a mile every single moment of every single day. And Christ came, God came to be with us. Let me give you two things that I think will change you this Christmas. It'll change your world, change your life, change your outlook if you let him in this area. Number one, be changed by Emmanuel's glory. Be changed by his glory. Look back at our text of the middle of verse. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And notice the first thing we see when we look to Christ. We beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We beheld His glory. John included himself in this us. He said, we, we have seen. John saw His glory. John saw the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Christ in His glory. And he's trying to convey to us, we have seen His glory. It ought to change us. It ought to motivate us to be in right relationship with Him. His glory is revealed in a unique way through his life, through his miracles, through his death, through his resurrection, and yes, even his birth. How all that happened brings glory and honor to God. And yet there are believers in the room. Let's be honest today. We have not yet, and here we are Christmas Eve, we've yet to worship God and say, God, thank you for the gift of your son. We can't sing to him in church. We can't sing to him when we hear the songs and the hymns of the faith. We can't worship him because of what he's done. That's why he did it to bring glory and honor to his name. And that Luke 2 passage we read today, the end of that after he says, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And then how does that end? With glory to God in the highest. It, the reason Christ came was to get glory for God, not for us. We're not the end. We're not the purpose of the incarnation. We're a means. Our need and Christ meeting that need brings glory to God. That's the agenda. That's what makes this story and these words so transformational. Just as our words reveal our mind and heart, and they do, whether you claim they do, oh, I just said, I didn't really mean that, that's just in a pressure moment. Our words are, are an expression of who we are. Christ, as the word, reveals the mind and heart of God to men. You want to know what God says? You want to know what he thinks? You want to know how he feels? Look to the glorious incarnation of Jesus Christ. I love in Revelation 22 where Christ says, I am Alpha and Omega. 
He's the beginning of the alphabet, Greek speaking, the end of the alphabet. He's everything in between. He is the communication of God. He is how we know and how we experience the glory of God. I think we have time to look at it for just a moment. Would you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number th- uh, 3? You say, Pastor, why do I need this glory? Why do I need to be in right relationship with this glory? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 answers that question. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's begin in verse 17. Earlier it talks about Moses and the veil and this separation between God and man that existed in the Old Covenant, that existed in the Old Testament. And then in verse 17, this veil is taken away. Notice, now. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Where do we look to find that? We look to Christ. We look to His Word. Are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so it is the glory of Christ. It's not seeing him as an average guy or a good prophet or a guru, but seeing him as the, ex, the expression of the glory of God. That's what changes us. That's what will change your family. So it will change your heart and life as you look to God is with us. You and I today must recognize how special and unique Jesus is. He alone can express the glory of God, and that glory alone is what can change you. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. I was just working through for my own benefit. Have you heard that there are other holidays around this season? That's why sometimes, you know, to be politically correct or whatever, generic people say happy holidays. You know there are other winter holidays or holy days, don't you? Just a few that come to my mind that I hear bantered around this time of the year. Hanukkah, uh, which this year was December 12th through the 20th, so it's already over. Um, it, It has some cycles that affect when it is during the year. But it's an eight-day commemoration in Judaism marking the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees after the victory over the Syrians. And this is a, they have the, the menorah and the lights and the, the festival that goes with that, the special candelabra that they use called the menorah. And that, that occurs every year. Um, second one, Kwanzaa, probably you've heard of that. Um, that's December 26th, so that'll start the day after Christmas through New Year's Day. And that's every year that it's those days that, that week. Um, It's a celebration of African heritage and culture. It was created back in 1966, and they have all kinds of things they do to celebrate in the evenings as well. They light candles in that observance. And then you have winter solstice, which would have just occurred this past week on December 21st, the first day of winter, the longest night of the year. Um, And they view that, those who celebrate winter solstice, which if you live in a secular culture, as some of my my brother who's in London, he gets interacts with a lot of this, but they will not say even happy holidays. They'll just say happy winter solstice. That's the only thing generically they can say that is unoffensive. Um, And they celebrate on the 21st that night in the morning when the sun dawns. Typically, you'll see pictures on the news around Stonehenge. Have you seen that in England? And the, the sun will usually cross the horizon about 8 o'clock in the morning, and they see it as the rebirth of the sun. And those are just three examples. There are other holidays sub- celebrated by Muslims and other faiths, Buddhists, and other religions. But can I just tell you that what we're celebrating is not one of many. It's not one of many ways to be changed. It's not one of, way, one of many ways to receive from death to life, to receive glory from shame, to receive liberty from bondage. There's only one, and the reason is because God is a part of what we're celebrating. God is with us, and he's chosen to be with us only through the person and working of Jesus Christ. There is no life-altering, eternity-shaking change in these other faiths and secular celebrations because Christ is not there. It is only what we who believe in Christ and those who would choose to do so today can experience that power. It's unique. It's special. I love the example of the apostles after they healed the lame man at the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. They say this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ. God is with us, and I'm telling you, He's only with us when we respond to His Son. When we say, I'm a sinner, you're the Savior, I repent of sin, I receive your gift of salvation. That's the only way this glory, this transformational glory, can enter our heart and life. All right, lastly, go back to our text in John chapter 1 and look at the end of verse 14. John chapter 1, and let's look at the end of verse 14. All right, so this glorious 
uh, manifestation of the word can be transformational. Notice now the end of the verse. It says this, the only begotten of the Father, notice this, comma, full of grace and truth. Lastly, jot this down, be changed by Emmanuel's balance. Emmanuel's balance. The other day I was reading of a uh, pastor who they had like a major crisis a few years ago on a Christmas Eve. Um, the uh, electricity died. I mean, the building just went black. And uh, so a few of the ushers and deacons grabbed some candles and they began to light the, the service. It wasn't supposed to be a candlelight service as we're going to have next Sunday night. It was just, a, okay, grab some candles. We got some light. Okay, let's regroup. And uh, the pastor said, uh, after all that, he said, then I reentered the pulpit, shuffled my notes and muttered, now where was I? All right, this is after all this. And in the back, he heard a tired voice call out right near the end. You're, you're right near the end. Um, Sometimes our, our, our response to the truth or how we communicate the truth is not real graceful. What I love about Jesus Christ is he's so balanced. Uh, these two concepts of grace and truth. First of all, he was full of truth. We'll get to grace in just a moment. This truth that represents God faithfully. There's no tradition. There's no um, extra biblical kind of things. It's just only what's true of God, what's true of us. And Jesus is what embodies that. Where are you looking for your truth today? Some of you listen to way too much talk radio. You watch way too much news. You, you look to all kinds of things to get your truth. Can I just rein you and encourage you to rein back in your focus to Jesus Christ? Is he the source of your truth? He is the one who can change you and receive the truth that he offers. Is the truth? Truth of Jesus alone that is transformational because it alone rightly exposes our flaws and then elevates God's standard. It brings conviction. It brings clarity because it's so honest. It's so direct and yet also so tender. Secondly, you will notice not only was he full of truth, but he was full of grace. Can I give you a definition of truth or of grace? I think you need to jot this down if you're taking notes today. I thought this was the best definition I've heard on grace. Here it is. The sum total of all the spiritual favors God gives to his people. The sum total of all the spiritual favors God gives to his people. That's the grace he offers. The sum total of all of those favors that God offers to his people are only available through Jesus Christ. And In fact, look down, if you will, at verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received, here in John 1, and grace for grace. The idea of that language is that as one grace subsides, a new grace re reveals itself, and it's almost the idea of waves hitting the shore. Wave hits the shore, and as it recedes, the next wave comes, and God's grace, God's grace just keeps coming, and it comes through the ministry and the message and the person of Jesus Christ. Are you receiving today this grace that he offers? Uh, verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. God has given us grace and and truth through him. As we finish today, I want you to look at verse 18, and this will bring our thoughts to conclusion. John chapter 1, verse 18. Before we read that verse, uh, last Sunday night we had our, our Christmas program. Kids did a great job. Uh, Miss Brandy and Stacy and others, Pastor Dave and those that work with them, did such a good job, and uh, it was just a blessing to be there. But one of the things I love in those settings, and I hope you understand, I wasn't watching you to. to to analyze you necessarily, but I love to watch grandparents, especially watch their grandkids. Um, and I'll, I'll watch the program and keep straight in my head what I got to remember for the evening. But I just love to watch grandkids watch or grandparents watch their grandkids and they'll smile, you know, and sometimes a nervous, oh, are they doing that right now in front of everybody? You know, that kind of, although grandparents think it's funny. The parents are the ones cringing, right? My child is embarrassing the family. You know, grandparents just back there laughing their head off. One of the things I've no I noticed again last night or last Sunday night, and I observe almost every time we have something like that, is that while everybody's looking forward and everybody's being open and transparent, that some, even in that moment with all the joy and all the youth exuberance, there's still sorrow there. Um, some that were here were hurting. Uh, some that were here were searching. Some that were here, despite all the props of the season and all of what was going on up here, where they sat, there was a burden. You could see that. You could sense that. They were here. They were doing their best, but there was still a burden. The other day, I read a statement that I think speaks to the challenge we face, and, and some of you that are ahead of me on this would agree, I'm sure, more than even I know. But here's the statement. It's easy to be young and idealistic or old and cynical. 
It's difficult to be soberly hopeful. It's difficult to be soberly hopeful. Now, the reason this morning we can acknowledge we got some real problems. We, our world is crumbling. Our culture is in chaos. The trends are not in our favor. But the reason in the midst of that soberness we can have hope is because of these four words. Look, if you will, at verse 18, and this is what changes the narrative in our story and changes the narrative as we look at the future. Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Notice the beginning of that verse again. It says two 100% statements. Did you notice that? No man. And then notice it says, has seen God at any time. No man at any time. But God, the Son, who knows God, who knows his purpose, knows his hope, he has revealed the Father, and because he has revealed the Father, we can have hope, we can have change. See, this morning, the only way to possess sober hope is through the transformational potential that is seen in the Word and believed in in the Word, which is Jesus Christ. Now, here's the question as we finish, because we all have things we wish would change, don't we? You do and I do. Things I wish would change yesterday, things I would at least hope would change by tomorrow. My question is not what's the change, but where are you looking for that change? Who are you letting define and direct and and redirect that change that you so long for? The four little words that are epic words are this, God is with us. Do you know that today, and are you living in light of those truths? Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you for the word. Thank you for this chapter that gives to us a theological framework, but also a practical premise upon which we can have sober hope. Lord, most of us in the room, if we're honest, we would lean toward one of those two things.